welcome to the Political Philosophy Podcast. I'm Toby Buckle. What you're about to listen to is the first part of a two-part solo series on a dispute that occurred in the 1960s between Karl Popper and Theodore Adorno. This was originally intended to be just a one-part episode, similar to my Mill vs. Rules, but like that one, it did end up becoming quite long once I had all the material together. I also just felt that to even approach this debate, we needed to do a certain amount of historical context. Otherwise, I either wouldn't do justice to what was being asserted and argued here, or it simply wouldn't make any sense. And given how challenging a lot of this material is, I decided to do it in two parts. One, which explains the history and the context of what's going on here, which can be more than a little confusing for students approaching this for the first time. And the second, which gets into like the gnarly details of the debate, or rather the failure to have a debate, as you will see. This topic was actually chosen by listeners. I gave a sort of multiple choice one, and this came out on top, which I'm happy to talk about, and I'm always surprised when I give viewers options how hardcore they lean in terms of the topics and material that they want me to cover, which I'm more than happy to do. So I, I, I really, as you'll see, I read you big chunks of this. I really like this. I'm sort of surprised to hear that other people want to hear about it as well, but I think that's just wonderful. And we've created a community of people here who are really into this stuff. So this is the first part. The next part will be out in a week or so. I've got most of the material down now. I'll just need to edit it together. In terms of going forward, wow, I mean, this has been a busy political week. As I've been recording this, Democrats in the US have finally announced that they're starting formal impeachment hearings. And in my home country, the government just lost a case, unanimously actually, in the Supreme Court that its prorogation of Parliament was illegal. Closer to home and in the circles I run in, the Working Families Party in New York, which is a sort of left-wing progressive third party, who I used to work for, and I know a lot of the people who still do work there, has been receiving racist abuse from a minority of Bernie Sanders supporters, as well as death threats and rape threats to its leadership, um, because they endorsed Elizabeth Warren instead. And I'm pleased to see that basically the entire political leadership of New York has condemned this behavior. It's something I've been tweeting about a lot, um, but haven't covered on the show, just like I haven't covered Brexit recently, or at least the recent developments, or the impeachment. I was sort of almost on the edge of my seat deciding, because I could do on any one of those three developments I just talked about, I could easily do a solo episode with my reactions. But I've decided not to, because this isn't a current events podcast. I will cover them probably all eventually, but I think there's so many people just giving you their minute-by-minute reacts to the news, some better, some worse. I don't really know what I'd be adding in that space. So I certainly do want to cover impeachment. I definitely am going to have to return to Brexit again. And I do also want to cover the nomination and what I think is going well there and what I think are the failures of progressives to communicate with each other, but when I do so, I want to be able to do so in a way that brings some analytic or philosophical or theoretical depth to it and gives you a way of thinking about it that you might not have had before. So don't get me wrong, those are three topics that have been exercising a lot of my bandwidth recently, and I'm considering various guests to get on to address them, or what I could say that wouldn't be mere punditry. But I think in balance, I was correct to fight the urge to do a solo episode on 
any of them. And then, of course, if you have been a little overwhelmed by the pace of news and the amount of news and the consequentialness of the news recently, now, as they say in the British cult comedy TV series Monty Python's Flying Circus, it's time for something completely different. So, let's take an hour outside of our worries about Brexit or impeachment or the various wranglings of the left that I've been following, and go back to the year 1960, in which one of the most acrimonious and hilarious exchanges between two senior social scientists ever took place, and that'll be the subject of the next two episodes. So, without further preamble, let's get straight in. This is Popper vs. Adorno, Part 1, History and Context. funny. I'm not talking about a wry chuckle from a quip or, oh, you know, that was a that was a good retort, good retort, sir, but, uh, like, have you ever been made to genuinely laugh out loud by academic writing? Please do, by the way, um, if you have, send me, um, email me, tweet at me, what, what, what has, because I'd love to see yours as well. There's, there's one for me that stands out. And I say this by means of an introduction to a book, really more a compilation of essays, that I really love, and absolutely nobody else does, including the authors and participants of this discussion. I refer, and this episode will detail and go into depth on, a small but very dense tome titled The Positivist Dispute, in German sociology. If you haven't come across this before, strap in, you're in for a treat. But if you just picked it up, I think the interestingness of this would be somewhat belied by its presentation. So if you were to look, for instance, at the table of contents, it would not be immediately clear what you had picked up or why you should read it. So this is the table of contents. I have it in front of me. Theodore W. Adorno, Introduction. Theodore W. Adorno, Sociology and Empirical Research. Karl R. Popper, The Logic of the Social Sciences. Theodore Adorno, The Logic of the Social Sciences. Darendorf, Remarks on the Discussion. Habermas, The Analytical Theory of Science and Dialectics. Hans Albert, The Myth of Total Reason. Habermas again, a positivistically bisected rationalism. Hans Albert, behind positivism's back. Harold Pilot, Habermas's empirically falsifiable philosophy of history. Hans Albert, a short, surprised postscript to a long introduction. Okay, so... This is just about the last thing you would ever want to read, right? But let's just say that you got past that uh, rather intimidating, rather dense, rather boring sounding, quite frankly, table of contents. And you're like, okay, well, let's read the introduction. The introduction should at least give me some sense of what's contained in this book. Why am I reading this? At a first pass, it seems to be some sort of dispute between Popper and Adorno. But, like, what is going on here? Well, the introduction is written by Adorno. And if this is your first time reading it, just see if you can make any sense of this whatsoever. I'm just going to quote at length, starting with the first sentence. So this is, this is how the book introduces itself to you. Quote, 
In his incisive remarks on the Tübingen discussion, the two papers which marked the beginning in Germany of public controversy on dialectics and positivistic sociology in the broadest sense, Ralph Darendorf regrets that the discussion, quote, generally lacked the intensity which would have been appropriate to the actual differences in views, end quote. According to him, some of the participants in the discussion censored the lack of tension between the symposists' papers. Downdorf, for his part, senses, quote, the irony of such points of agreement, and, end quote, and suggests that profound differences in the matters discussed are hidden between similarities in formulation. But the only conciliatory attitude of the two symposists was not the reason why no discussion actually came about, in which the reasons and counter-reasons might have interacted upon one another. The symposists were primarily concerned to make their positions in general, theoretically commensurable, nor was it merely a question of the attitude of the several participants in the discussion who asserted their estrangement from philosophy, an estrangement which, in some cases, has only recently been acquired. The dialectics have explicit recourse to philosophy, but the methodological interests of the positivists are hardly less alien to naively practised research activity. Okay, and let's end quote there. You'll be pleased to hear that introduction goes on, much in the same vein, and just as incomprehensibly, for over a hundred pages. But you can sense, even if maybe you didn't catch every word of that, a sort of angry defensiveness to the tone, right? Adorno's pissed about something. Right? And this is sort of what I love about this book, is everyone is so angrily talking past each other about everything, including, like, how and why the book came to be written. So let's go, before we get stuck into the um, actual philosophy of this, to Karl Popper's account of this. And Popper, you'll hear, is also very angry and very defensive about this, but he at least communicates the history of how this book came to be written in more or less everyday language. So I'm going to read you from this at length, because I find this hilarious. You might not, you might not share my sense of humour, but anyway, let's just, let's just do it. So, um, this is from a popper, a paper which got amended to later editions called Reason or Revolution, which he sort of wrote looking back on the whole thing. So this is how he tells the history, quote, In 1960, I was invited to an open discussion on, quote, the logic of the social sciences at a congress of German sociologists in Tübingen. By the way, if I mispronounce some German names in this, you're just going to have to get used to that. I, continuing the quote, I accepted and was told that my opening address would be followed by a reply from Professor Theodore Adorno of Frankfurt. It was suggested to me by the organisers, in order to make a fruitful discussion possible, I should formulate my views in a number of definitive theses. Or theses, sorry. This I did. My opening address to that discussion, delivered in 1961, consisted of 27 sharply formulated theses, plus a programmatic formulation on the task of theoretical social sciences. Of course, I formulated these to make it difficult for any Hegelian or Marxist, such as Adorno, to accept them. And I supported them, as well I could, by arguments. Owing to the limited time available, I confined myself to fundamentals, and I tried to avoid repeating what I had said elsewhere. End quote. So firstly, I just want to call your attention to something that is just simmering under the surface of this whole debate, which is the egos of the two participants. I presented Professor Adorno with 27 sharply formulated theses. Oh, you, you know, like, they, they, and again in Adorno's, the sort of grandiosity of his language introducing it. They, they really they really believe themselves to be academic supermen, at least in this. I think it really brought out the worst qualities of the two men in a way that I find absolutely 
hilarious. But so basically to summarise, you know, they were having some sort of like, not even debate, but public exchange of views sort of thing. And Adorno, uh, sorry, Popper presented some theses that he had put together on the social sciences. So just continuing from his paper, um, this is Popper just continuing on from where I left off. Quote, Adorno's reply was read with great force, but he hardly took up my challenge, that is, my 27 theses. In the ensuing debate, Professor Ralph Darendorf expressed his grave disappointment. He said that it had been the intention of the organisers to bring into the open some of the glaring differences. Apparently, he included political and ideological differences between my approach to the social sciences and Adorno's. But the impression created by my address and Adorno's reply was, he said, one of sweet agreement, a fact which left him flabbergasted. I was, and still am, very sorry about this. But having been invited to speak about the, quote, logic of the social sciences, I did not go out of my way to attack Adorno and the, quote, dialectical school of Frankfurt, Adorno, Horkheimer, Habermas, et al., which I never regarded as important, unless perhaps from a political point of view. And in 1960, I was not even aware of the political influence of this school. Although today, I should not hesitate to describe its influence by such terms as irrationalist and intelligence destroying. I could never take their methodology, whatever that may mean, seriously from either an intellectual or a scholarly point of view. Knowing now a little more, I think that Darendorf was right in being disappointed. I ought to have attacked them, using arguments I had previously published in The Open Society and The, Pos the Poverty of Historicism, and in, quote, What is Dialectic? Even though I do not think that these arguments fall under the heading of the logic of the social sciences, for terms that do not matter. My only comfort is that the responsibility for avoiding a fight rests squarely on the second speaker. Okay, end quote. Let's take a little pause here. Can you just sense the tone in which this is being written? <laughs> I do not quote, which I never regarded as important. And I do not hesitate to describe as intelligence destroying. <laughs> so anyway, continuing, continuing with the quote. However this may be, Darendorf's criticism stimulated a paper almost twice as long as my original address by Professor Habermas, another member of the Frankfurt School. It was in this paper, I think, that the term positivism first turned up in this particular discussion. I was criticised as a positivist. This is an old misunderstanding created and perpetuated by people who know of my work only secondhand. And, end quote, he goes on to evidence his, that he's made many arguments against positivism, he's not a positivist, and why he thinks that misunderstanding comes. He goes on to say, quote, In my defence, Professor Hans Albert, not a positivist either, wrote a spirited reply to Habermas's attack. The latter answered, and was answered a second time by Albert. This exchange was mainly concerned with the general character and tenability of my views. Thus, there was little mention and no serious criticism of my opening address in 1961 and of its 27 theses. End quote. Dude, the 27 theses, they're done. Let them go. Stop. Stop circling around this point. Um, anyway, moving on. Quote. It was, I think, in 1964 that a German publisher asked me whether I would agree to have my address published in a book form, together with Adorno's reply and the debate between Habermas and Albert. I agreed. End quote. Okay, so now we're finally, um, and this is only in an article written some years after the book, we're finally sort of, as someone approaching it for the first time, we're finally learning what this thing is about. But when it does come together, Popper is not going to be happy with the result. So he goes on to say, quote, but as published in 1969, so almost a, so end quote, almost a decade later, this thing's been going on for. So 
Quote, the book consists of two quite new introductions by Adorno, 94 pages, followed by my address of 1961, 20 pages, with Adorno's original reply, 18 pages, Darren Dorff's complaint, 9 pages, the debate between Habermas and Albert, 150 pages, a new contribution by Harold Pilot, 28 pages, and, quote, a short, surprised postscript to a long introduction by Albert, five pages. In this, Albert mentions briefly that the affair started with a discussion between Adorno and myself in 1961, and he says quite rightly that a reader of the book would hardly recognise what it was all about. This is the only allusion in the book to the story behind it. There is no answer to the question of how the book got a title, which quite wrongly indicates that the opinions of some, quote, positivists are discussed in the book. Even Albert's postscript does not answer this question. What is the result? My 27 theses, end quote, sorry. Dude, let the 27 theses go. (laughs) Um... quote, intended to start a discussion, and so they did after all, are nowhere taken seriously in this longish book, and not a single one of them, although one or another passage from my address is mentioned here or there, usually out of context to illustrate my positivism and he puts quotes around positivism. Moreover, my address is buried in the middle of the book, unconnected from the beginning and the end. No reader can see, and no reviewer can understand, why my address, which I cannot but regard as being quite unsatisfactory in this present setting, is included in the book, or even what the unadmitted theme of the whole book is. Thus, no reader would suspect, and no reviewer did suspect, What I suspect is actually the truth of the matter. It is that my opponents literally did not know how to criticise rationally my 27 theses. Theses, I've been calling it both in this, apologies. All they could do was label me a positivist, thereby unwittingly giving a highly misleading name to a debate in not in which not one single positivist was involved. And having done so, they then drowned my short paper and the original issue of the debate in an ocean of words, which I found only partially comprehensible. End quote. Okay, so I read that at length because I just think that the degree to which these belligerents get worked up in this debate is absolutely hilarious, and I think Popper in particular is just really funny in his anger and in his sanctimony about his beloved 27 Theses. But what is happening here? So if you were to sort of take away all the rancour, what Popper is basically saying is, well, to quote him, they literally didn't know how to criticise me, so they just called me a positivist. In modern debate, we would say, I got straw manned, right? They're calling me this label, which I've explicitly disavowed, and they're attributing beliefs to me that I don't hold, and then attacking those beliefs. And, like, I don't know what else that I can say to you in that position. And that is, by the way, what is happening here, right? Um, It's kind of just not very nice, right, to keep on going, no, you really are a positivist. Um, So as everyone in this debate and who's ever come back to it in retrospect, these people are just talking past each other. So what is actually going on on the other side then. I can read you Popper in his own words. Adorno, not so much. But I will say, and one of the reasons I thought it might be fun to do this, is I remember during my MA, I was sort of known as, you know, we did this uh, course on methodology and the social sciences, and we'd take on different approaches, different schools of thought, and so on. And I was sort of known as the Frankfurt School Whisperer, as in, this was just utter, incomprehensible gibberish to all of us coming across it for the first time. But I, we all did talks where we presented papers to the class, and I was sort of known as the one who could translate the Frankfurt School, particularly Adorno, 
into plain English. And so I want to give it a go here. Yes, the Frankfurt School, and Adorno specifically here, is talking past its opponents. And yes, the label of positivist is an inaccurate um, straw man. Um, but what's it there, and what, what do they think that they're asserting on the other side? So let's start at the beginning. What is the Frankfurt School? Well, let's start with what it's not. If you follow the culture war debates, you'll have heard the term cultural Marxism, right? This is the big bogeyman. This is, well, the straw man, actually. On the other side, uh, Jordan Peterson and so on uses the term all the time, and to the extent that they are able to define it, the people who use that term trace it back to uh, the Frankfurt School. So Habermas, Adorno, Adorno in particular, because he did engage in cultural criticism. Um, and I'm just going to read you from the Wikipedia page on the Frankfurt School. There's a subheading titled Cultural Marxism Conspiracy Theory. Just the first paragraph. In contemporary usage, the term cultural Marxism refers to a far-right anti-Semitic conspiracy theory which claims that the Frankfurt School is part of an ongoing academic and intellectual effort to undermine and destroy Western culture and values. According to the conspiracy theory, which emerged in the late 1990s, the Frankfurt School and other Marxist theories were part of a conspiracy to attack Western society by undermining traditionalist conservatism and Christianity, using the 1960s counterculture, multiculturalism, progressive politics, and political correctness. The conspiracy theory is associated with American religious fundamentalists and paleoconservatives, such as William S. Lind, Pat Buchanan, and Paul Ryak, end quote. Um, so you can just go read on Wikipedia, but basically whenever someone says cultural Marxism, that should just be a red flag that you're dealing with someone who either doesn't know what they're talking about or more likely is consciously giving you a conspiracy theory. So that's what the Frankfurt School isn't, and I could do a whole episode just on how it's been dragged in to this weird alt-right conspiracy theory in modern times, but I just want to note, first of all, that is what it is not. What is the Frankfurt School in its own terms, and why are they obsessed with attacking positivism? Well, the Frankfurt School are critical theorists, and I think their accounts of positivism can be understood, I'm going to try and place this in some intellectual history, um, as a response to the crises that occurred within the Marxist tradition, as it becomes apparent that the key predictive elements of Marx won't be fulfilled. So Marx says, you know, capitalism, you know, this is really dense stuff, by the way, and people who really, really know it might have to grit their teeth through some of my big summaries of it. But Marx sort of has this end of history thesis, right? Capitalism contains within itself the seeds of its own destruction. And it sort of has like a Christianity problem in that Christ and his first um, followers say the world is ending within our lifetimes. And then it just doesn't. And so how do you continue to be a Christian and have a belief in the truth of Christianity when the, you know, the very concrete and very specific prediction hasn't come true? And so a lot of early Christian thought is sort of thinking their way out of that. Exact same thing for Marxism. How do you believe in Marxism, which remember many of its adherents don't just see as a description or as... Um, you know, an account of what we would like to see in the world, they see it as a scientific account of, you know, what they would call, quote, objective reality. So how do you make, so what, what sense is there to be made of Marxism being true, and it being true in that sense, but this big revolutionary end of history has has, has never happened? So within what you might call um, orthodox Marxist thought. There's a number of um, theories that attempt to defend the thesis of the inevitable collapse of capitalism. So um, during and after the First World War and Russian Revolution, 
these tend to focus on imperialism as the what Lenin called the highest stage of capitalism. So Lenin is sort of imagining that imperialism is going to give capitalism a sort of extra burst of life, but it's still going to be doomed in in the end. Um, in contrast to this, you got the self-described evolutionary socialists. Check out, by the way, the second part of my libertarianism series for how the concept and the theory of evolution had a huge impact on political debates in all sorts of different ideologies. Um, but without getting into that here, um, evolutionary socialists are people like Edward Bernstein, who sort of attempt to say, you know, that there are flaws in Marx, right? And they, they want to say that Marx's predictive and empirical reasoning may not be all that, while retaining the sort of central normative thrust. Um, that is then in turn criticised by um, orthodox writers such as Rosa Luxemburg, and she has a polemic called Reform and Revolution, and all of this debate becomes known as the revisionist controversy. Um, the, the, the central issue is not just about a description, it's about what's the correct strategy for Marxists to pursue. And for all of the technical weediness that the Popper versus Adorno debate got into, I think that's actually what's at the heart of it. What is the correct strategy for those who want to change the world politically? Is it incremental reforms within a democratic system? as uh, Bernstein and the evolutionary socialists are arguing? Or is it the more ambitious strategy of revolution, of a total rebuilding of the social structure? So you've got within Marxism at the turn of the century this evolution versus revolution debate. And against the backdrop of this debate, a number of theories attempt to move beyond the divide. And this is where critical theory and the Frankfurt School are going to come in. And they're going to say, we're going to be revolutionary, but only in a sense. And so the sense in which they are revolutionary is they're going to say, we're going to have a revolutionary criticism of the social totality. I'll explain that word in a sec. But we're going to have this revolutionary criticism, but we are going to sort of walk away from the, the sort of no longer tenable, what Marx would say, laws of historical development, and the positivist, let's start bringing that word in, understanding of Marxism as scientific law. So we are going to be revolutionary. Our criticism of the world is going to be revolutionary. But we're, no, we're separating that revolutionariness, if you can call it that, from an understanding of Marxism as giving us objective scientific laws of history. That's the intellectual context, which I think is going to make sense of why they are so concerned to call Karl Popper a positivist, and why they really feel like he's missing something which he's not getting from their communication. So what I'm trying to do in this is give you an account from the other side. I think when I read you Popper, it's quite easy to sympathise with him and be like, yeah, I've said many times I'm not a positivist, that I don't think, you know, scientific method is directly applicable to the social sphere, and yet they insist on calling me one and making all of these arguments against positivism and making them in bewilderingly complex language. And what I'm going to try and do here is, like, show you in ordinary language, because, you know, I can just read Popper's arguments to you and you'll follow them. I can't read Adorno to you. I'm going to try and translate the Frankfurt School, the Critical Theory School, particularly Adorno, into what do they think they're doing and what's at stake for them in making these arguments. Now, in doing that, it has to be admitted that the first thing to be said of, against Adorno here is that it requires a translation. It requires, like, a lot of... It, 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 you've got to know Marxist history to even begin to make sense of why this 
is important to them. But let's let's give it a go anyway. So like I said, there was this division within Marxism because the end of history stuff hasn't happened. And do we go in an evolutionary way in response to that? Or do we double down on revolution? And critical theory can be seen as trying to say, let's, let's try and have the best of both worlds. Let's retain a revolutionary criticism of society while rejecting a positivist description of it. So how do they do that? Well, in order to achieve it, and I, I should, I guess, just say these theorists are different and they do it in different ways, so I am talking in generalities here when I talk of critical theory, but they, they refocus the debate onto questions of method. More specifically, they attempted to bring out in, in Marx the Hegelian dialectic methodology while moving beyond the end of history theses with which that method had been historically associated. So let me try and explain this idea of the dialectic. And I had a, an exchange with a philosopher on Twitter a while ago, and he basically said, I don't know what to make of the claims of some of these people to have a method. And look, I don't see the world in this way either, but people who are by no means idiots claim to find a lot of value in it. So this is the best I've got with an understanding of what we mean by dialectics. It, it's um, a description of a process, and that process might be at work in the social world, it might be at work in some sort of underlying substructure of history, it might be at work at the conceptual level, but before we even get to that, let me just try and um, I explain this. So, in the writings of both Hegel and Marx, you find this notoriously untranslatable German word, Aufheben. And as it's being used by the theorists, it has four specific meanings. It means to be the same as, it means to be different from, it means to preserve, and it means to destroy. So that's, that's, that's that word. And, and what it's describing is this. Within everything, there is a contradiction which will then become something separate from itself. And those two separate things must then be reconciled. And in that reconciliation, some parts of their meaning will be preserved and some parts will be destroyed. So let's start at the basics, existence. I exist, right? That is a statement, that is a thing, that is a concept. In order for that statement to make sense, it must demarcate something else. You're drawing a line around something, and there has to be something on the other side of that line. So for us to say we exist, that logically necessitates its opposite, non-existence. Without, you know, to, to, to say that there is light requires that there be dark. So Existence necessitates its opposite, which is non-existence. So in the act of defining a concept, or maybe even in the act of that concept existing, its opposite is then present. But then those two are in opposition with each other. You know, we, we now have two things that both can't be true at once. Do we exist or do we not exist? So they have to be reconciled. And they're reconciled in this idea of becoming. So from the opening, you know, you say I exist, Descartes, right? That implies that there's such a thing as, as non-existence. And in the reconciliation, how do, we, how do we make sense of those two opposites? Well, we say I am becoming. I was non-existence and now I am existence. And I am moving again towards non-existence. I am becoming. Now, the idea of Hegel is through this process, which we can call a dialectic, basically everything can be explained, right? That through 
continually applying this dialectic step to itself, we can sort of create a logical theory of everything, including a logical structure to history that is detectable and discoverable by looking back at history, but whose fundamental structure is dialectic in nature. That is, that it is explained and described by a series of these steps. <sighs> okay, we ready for our first breather on this one? So let's... um. So let's um, bring this back to uh, Marxism, right? What would a dialectic step in Marxism look like? Well, let me sketch one out for you. And, you know, this is all very contested and different Marxists and theorists will say, that's not what it's about. This is what it's about. You know, I'm just giving you the way I've learned to understand it. Um, but you could think about um, the move from capitalism to communism as a dialectical step. So to begin with, you have feudalism, in which you have undifferentiated unity. So everyone is like the same, but society is, is unified, right? Everyone's sort of a survivalist farmer, but they all feel as part of one community. Capitalism is, is opposite, Right? You remember the first part of the dialectical step is a, is a thing necessitates its opposite. So what's the opposite of undifferentiated unity is differentiated disunity. So in capitalism, everyone's different. Everyone gets to be an individual, as the libertarians tell us. But there's also no unity. There's no community. There's no sense of togetherness. So... The first step is a thing necessitates its opposite. Um, undifferentiated unity necessitates a state of differentiated disunity. But then it's not just that creation of opposites. The next part of the dialectical step is the reconciliation in which some aspects are preserved and some aspects are destroyed. So what's preserved is differentiation and unity. We move to a state of differentiated unity in which people are individuals, but there's also a community. There's also solidarity with each other. And the worst parts of both of those understandings from both capitalism and feudalism are destroyed. The disunity of capitalism is abandoned, but the undifferentiated nature of feudalism is also abandoned. So communism is the dialectic reconciliation of the best aspects of feudalism and capitalism. Now, I'm not saying you have to accept this. I don't. I don't think this is right or correct in any way. I'm sort of just trying to explain to you what the world looks like through someone else's eyes. I think the best overall dialectic reading of Marx is uh, Cohen, Marx's Dialectic of Labour. That was in 1974, so a little bit after the period that we're talking about. But there's a whole range of responses to this. Um, another someone we can look at, I think Cohen is the best, actually, and he's sort of a modern uh, one. At the time, there was also someone like George Lucas, who takes what gets called the extravagant account. And Lucas claims that uh, Bernstein might be right. Indeed, all the empirical claims in Marx might turn out to be false, but this would not diminish in any way the value of Marxism, which is found in its dialectical method. I don't think that's a credible position, but that is something a really famous Marxist theorist held. Um, you've also got, um, working in this sort of similar vein, um, leading up to this period, someone like Antonio Gramsci, um, who has a much more subtle, his prison diaries are really excellent, by the way, really worth reading, uh, a more subtle understanding, but still he talks about dialectics a lot, which if you're not like inducted into this way of looking at the world, can make his uh, writings not fully appreciatable, shall we say. So, to sum up, 
we're in a period of intellectual history where there's a number of different people within the Marxist tradition trying to move beyond this divide between evolution and revolution. I sort of tried to make those two words rhyme. I know they don't. Um, and they do that by going back to this idea of the Hegel in Marx, the dialectic in Marx. Now, what that means then is as these Marxists were creating these new accounts of Marxism, distancing themselves from the view of Marxism as an objective science of history, they were then forced to create new accounts of subjectivity and objectivity. So in other words, if Marxism is still revolutionary, but it's revolutionary in this dialectical sort of way, not in this sort of scientific sort of way, then the problem then becomes, what do we mean by objective and subjective in this space? And this finally gets us back, <laughs> finally, right, to the beginning of the story. So critical theory, I think, can be understood as an umbrella term covering a number of different approaches to that problem. And so the Frankfurt School, this is what they're very concerned about. How do we think about the subject and the object given where we are in that intellectual history of Marxism that I've been laying out? That's sort of what's going on here. Critical theory is a response to that problem? How do you think about subjectivity and objectivity, given that we're pulling Marxism away from an understanding of itself as purely objective, and instead looking at it as a series of unfolding dialectical steps? And I think the solution that critical theory comes up with is most clearly understood by breaking it up into three levels. Um, ontology, epistemology, and methodology. And so I think this is, um, I got this um, from a paper by Ruben Grieve, um, but when you really aren't understanding what's going on in, uh, in uh, a sort of total theory of the world, which Marxism is, it can be useful to break it into these three layers. Ontology, what is there? What is actually there to be discovered? Um, epistemology, theory of knowledge, what can we know, what are the limits of our knowledge, and finally methodology, what are the steps that we would employ to go about gaining that knowledge. Um, otherwise, critical theory, I think, especially approaching it from the analytic tradition, can just appear mountains of bewildering gibberish, as it did to Popper, right? So let's break it down. Um, ontologically, what does critical theory say is sort of real? Ontologically, it employs a modified form of the dialectic concept of social totality. Um, this is huge for them, and in the debate we're about to get into, um, this is going to be referenced a lot. But society has to be understood as a whole, and subjects can only be understood in relation to that whole. Um, so that's sort of what they say is there. Their fundamental ontology revolves around this idea of social totality. Epistemologically, so what can we know about this social totality? Well, because the subject is a part of the totality and can only be understood in relation to it, um, his or her knowledge becomes a form of critical self-reflection or a critical opposition to the concepts and contradictions embedded in society and history. As such, it's value-mediated and subjectivist and never able to claim, as previous Marxists did and some modern social scientists do, an absolute objective understanding of the world. Um, and then finally, methodology-wise, the methodology that follows from this is not one 
it's of dialectical criticism and engagement with actual political oppression, um, not merely aiming at particular abuses and misconceptions, but the uh, an engagement with the impression oppression embodied within the social whole. Okay, so that's quite a lot, right? Um, and I'm going to break down what all of that means. But the the first point here is. So what about positivism, right? This is what this whole debate has in theory been about. Um, Positivism is a mirror image that critical theory has created along each of those three levels. Um, And it's a point of contrast to show the errors in thinking in rival theories. And it lumps together both orthodox Marxists and sort of liberal reforming social scientists as both equally inadequate, both of the view that there is objective knowledge to be had, and that can be had epistemologically by separating yourself and by analysing society as if you were not a part of it. So the, the role that positivism is playing and why it's so important for them is positivism is everything that they're not. And that, I think, explains their approach in this debate, in that I think there's sort of two things that are going on here. One is critical theorists, the Frankfurt School, have got used to talking in a very, very dense sort of way, what Popper will attack them as the cult of unintelligibility. I think that's definitely true, and I think that's definitely a valid critique. And you'll notice, by the way, I gave you Popper in his own words at length, and I'm going to do more so of this as we get on to the next part. I'm not quoting Adorno directly at all. I'm having to sort of summarise and say, this is where I think he's This is what I take him to mean. And even that, I have to go back to the intellectual history, and this is what these words mean, and blah, 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 blah. It's definitely a valid criticism of Adorno that he talks in a really dense way. I do think there's another side to this, though. And there's the other side to it, which is I do really get the feeling that critical theorists... I mean, rightly or wrongly, you can decide, but they really believe that they're onto something that their opponents are missing. They really believed that they, they've hit on something here. They really, they, they think they've developed a new understanding of subjectivity and objectivity that's really basically fundamental to understanding the world and their opponents aren't buying into it. And the, the, the positivist thing, saying, oh, well, you're a positivist, it's a little bit more than a straw man, or I think it's doing something different in their heads. It sounds different to them than it does to Popper. To Popper, he's just being accused of this thing, which is a label that he's consciously rejected, and that when he hears them describe seems completely not related to his actual views overall, to his history of published work, and what he specifically argued with his beloved 27 theses. I think, to the critical theorists, it's more sort of like saying, it's not X, it's Y. And that they re- where, where in that analogy where they say, it's not X, it's Y, X is positivism, and Y is critical theory being a particular understanding of the subject and the object, right? And so they're saying, look, it's not X, it's Y, and Popper's saying, but I'm not X. I think that's sort of at the crux of it, and I think really what you want to understand Adorno at all as sort of, they're using X to explicate Y, and that might not be the best argumentative strategy to convince someone like Popper, certainly it wasn't. Certainly Popper walked away from that, thinking that it was all just a cult of complete gibberish and people trying to sound smarter than they are. 
And so, yeah, I mean, certainly the critique that a different discursive strategy might have been appropriate. I do think it's worth asking, and I'm going to ask, well, what about the why? If X was there to sort of provide a point of contrast and it to, to explicate the why more fully, then, then let's have a look at that why. And I think that's the frustration on the critical theorist side of this debate. The frustration on Popper's side is he keeps going, I am not X, I am not a positivist. Why do you keep calling me that? And I really wish sort of like Adorno or Horkheimer or Habermas or any of the people who get involved in this could have sort of just said, what you're missing is the the why, the critical theory bit, in that we have an account of subjectivity and objectivity that we think makes sense of the world in a way that yours doesn't. I think that's what they're sort of trying, that's how I read them as saying. Um, And I talked before about the totality, and as we get into this debate we can go into a bit more what that word means, but I think at the heart of it you could say something like this. This is what Adorno and Habermas and so on, what they think they've hit on. They think that there's all these theorists out there who want to completely subsume the subject within the object or the object within the subject, who want to make it pure objectivity, as, and this is sort of the understanding of the positivist, right? Who says it's all just, you know, objective, you can just measure stuff and learn stuff, and it's just the application of the natural sciences to the social sciences. There's some people, on the other hand, you know, conversely, you might say, who want to make it purely subjective. It's all just about feeling and blah, 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 right? Um, and what they want to say is the relation between subject and object is a dialectic one in the sort of sense of the word dialectic that I've been laying out. And when someone comes along who doesn't get that, they're going to use this idea of positivism. They're going to say, you're a positivist. And they, they sort of mean by that you're not getting this sort of fundamental insight or set of insights that motivates our work. And that is the sort of intellectual bear trap that Popper has now walked into by his own admission, not really understanding anything about this school. I mean, remember the quote I read to you at the beginning, right? He said, I'd never even heard of these guys before. He just sort of knew that they were Marxists, wrote his bloody 27 theses, and was then sort of horrified and astonished by what he saw as just the verbal diarrhoea coming back at him from the other side. And so, and so here we are. Now, almost an hour in, we finally laid the groundwork to understand what is going on in one of the weirdest and certainly most acrimonious and, I think, personally hilarious in its acrimony exchanges that has ever occurred within the social sciences. And while it doesn't make much sense to ask who won the debate and who lost, neither side really talked directly to the other side in any of it, I still think it's interesting to look back on And I think there are things to be learned from this failure to have an intellectual exchange. Thank you for listening to the Political Philosophy Podcast. Next week will be part two. I think we covered the historical context so we can sort of follow what's going on in this debate. And then in the next part, I'm going to get into the debate proper and look at some of the arguments that are made for and against, particularly revolving around this idea of positivism in the social sciences. As always, I want to shout out and say a big thank you to anyone who shares the show on social media or sponsors us on Patreon.
I'm really grateful to all of it. All of the costs associated with running the show, which are, you know, they're real. I have to pay all sorts of hosting fees to SoundCloud and the website and so on and so forth. Uh, buy all these academic books y'all are making me read. I, I will say I was um, more than happy to reread The Positivist Dispute in German Sociology. I absolutely, and I have to be the only person in the world to say this, I absolutely love that book. Um, but all of those costs are met by listeners sponsoring us on Patreon. So if you are able to sponsor the show, please do check us out there, patreon.com stroke political philosophy podcast. And if you enjoy the episode, please do share it. Sharing's really huge. We haven't really done any paid promotions of the show at all. All the growth we've seen, which is fantastic, has come from listeners sharing. So if this was interesting or you know someone who it might be interesting for, uh, please do share, forward, all that good stuff. Apart from that, thank you for listening, and I hope you'll return for part two. (laughs) 